John chapter 18. Of course, in John 17, we have that prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And uh, John, of course, he deliberately skips over important things that the other Gospels have covered adequately and includes things that they have not covered at all. Uh, for example, the other Gospels do not carry the uh, upper room discourse. They do speak of Jesus being in the upper room the night before he was betrayed, but they only have him there uh, uh, conducting the Last Supper. John doesn't even include the Last Supper, but does have four or five chapters of things that transpire in the upper room. Uh, John contains this long prayer of Jesus, but does not mention the three prayers of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed that the cup might be removed from him. The synoptics include those prayers in the garden, but not this one. And so it is that all the way through the Gospel of John, we see John deliberately avoiding overlap between what he shares and what the synoptics have shared, which is, can be no accident. I mean, the things he leaves out are so significant uh, that he cannot be unaware of them, and he cannot think they're unimportant. But no doubt his reasoning was they have been covered adequately in the other Gospels, and he is filling in gaps that they omitted. And that would, you know, it'd be challenging to maintain this policy in the section we've come to, which is the arrest and the trials of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion. All four Gospels give us a lot of information on this subject, more chapters, uh, you know, than any other comparable short period of time occupy in the Gospels are given to the arrest and the trials of Jesus. He was arrested sometime in the late evening of a certain day of the week, which traditionally has been held to be Thursday night. And then he was crucified about uh, 9 in the morning the next day, which has traditionally been thought to be Friday. I say traditionally because there are arguments that have been made by competent scholars to say that Jesus was crucified not on Friday but on Thursday and others still have suggested on Wednesday. And I've read their complete arguments and to tell you the truth it's, uh, it's fairly impossible for me to ascertain which is the correct day nor does it matter in the least to me. I've never had any interest in, in the controversy but there is such controversy and I simply would say traditionally he was crucified on Friday and was arrested late the previous night which means that he can hardly have had uh, 12 hours between his arrest and his crucifixion. And yet there are many, many chapters in all four Gospels about this section of his life. Now, with that kind of overlap over such a small period, you'd think that John could not possibly continue his policy of omitting what the other Gospels include and including what they exclude. And indeed, he does not completely do so, but he does to a very large extent. There are events of that evening that are omitted by the other Gospels, which John includes. And there are those which the other Gospels, including John, omits. And so as we go through it, we're going to, of course, focus primarily on John, because that's the book we're studying. But I will inform you of the portions in the other Gospels that are omitted, uh, which John includes. Chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, meaning the prayer of John 17 and the previous discourse in the upper room, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now that garden in a couple of the Gospels is named for us. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. The brook Kidron is uh, to the east of Jerusalem. And from the actual wall of Jerusalem down to the brook is a drop of 200 feet. And then the Mount of Olives begins to rise on the other side. And just a little ways up the Mount of Olives, uh, you have this garden, which uh, is one of the few places in the Holy Land I've actually been. I have only been to Israel one time. And I was teaching for two weeks in Jerusalem and didn't get out much. Um, and I got a little bit. It's not too hard to get from Jerusalem to Mount of Olives. It's just a little ways. And that is uh, on the gradual slopes uh, near on the Jerusalem side of the Mount of Olives. 
This is the garden that he went to. Gethsemane apparently means olive press or oil press, um, which is interesting. Perhaps it's, of course, there's a of olives. There's olive trees there, and olives are for pressing into olive oil. That's what they grew olives for. And there must have been in Jesus' day, uh, you know, olive presses there, and they named it the Garden of Olive Press. Uh, Jesus was certainly pressed and pressured in that location so much so that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, the synoptics record at this point Jesus praying three times that if it were possible that God would remove this cup from him. Uh, and yet saying, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Interestingly, John doesn't include that. But there seems to be an allusion to it down in verse 11 of this chapter, where when Jesus was uh, arrested and Peter sought to rescue him, Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Now, John has given no previous mention of that cup, although the synoptic gospels did. And so we can see how the synoptics and John dovetail with each other. Obviously, John presupposes that his readers know about those prayers, about, you know, let this cup pass from him. Uh, because he records Jesus saying, the cup that my Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And uh, yet, and there are many other ways in which John alludes to things that the other Gospels say. So that we know that, you know, it's not as if these are separate traditions that are in conflict with each other, as some people would like to say. Many people have suggested that the Gospel of John is not really to be trusted because the picture of Jesus that it presents is so different than the picture that is given in the three synoptic Gospels. And that Jesus, of course, was the Jesus of the synoptics, and therefore he could not be the Jesus of the Gospel of John because his discourse was so different. There's no parables in his teaching in John, and he taught almost exclusively with parables in the synoptics, uh, and so forth. We've commented on this before, how that the, the general thought that John does not harmonize with the synoptics is quite misleading and misled because John does, in fact, dovetail with the synoptics. In fact, John's studied avoidance of repeating what the synoptics have said it seems like he could have never have pulled that off so successfully had he not been very familiar with what the synoptics did say and, and what he wished to not say so that he could say different things than they said, not contrary things, additional things. And yet, even in what he records, we find allusions to the things he left out, which the synoptics record, including this statement of the cup. Now, verse 2, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Now, this reference to a detachment of troops in the Greek, it refers to a Roman cohort. In Jerusalem, in the fortress Antonia, which was in Jerusalem, there were a thousand Roman soldiers, and they were under a captain. At one time, a later captain there rescued Paul from uh, a mob in the streets of Jerusalem in the final visit Paul made to Jerusalem when he was falsely accused of bringing a Gentile <clears throat> into the uh, court of the Jews at the temple, and the Jews rioted and sought to kill him, and one of these captains, the one at the time, uh, Claudius Lysias, I believe his name was, uh, actually came down and helped Paul and rescued him. This captain, uh, with his detachment of Roman troops, is not named for us, but uh, it's interesting that the Romans got involved, because Jesus had not yet been brought before a Roman court, and Jesus was not a threat to the Romans. He was a threat to the Sanhedrin. It's very important for us to realize that the Romans, though they crucified him, had no interest in crucifying him. And that's saying a lot for Romans, because Romans like to crucify people. And they love to crucify anyone who even, you know, looked at them cross-eyed or in any way seemed to be, uh, you know, unfavorable toward their regime. And yet it's obvious that the Romans had no particular interest in uh, arresting or condemning Jesus. The, the leader of the Romans, Pilate, 
tried again and again to release Jesus and, uh, and to go against the Jews' wishes that he should kill him. He only tr surrendered Jesus to them to be killed because they actually ended up um, claiming that if he didn't do so, that he was no friend of Caesar's, and that would look good on a resume for a Roman pro procurator. So uh, what's interesting is that Romans did come here. It wasn't just a Roman detachment, though. It was also officers of the chief priests and Pharisees. These would be the temple police. These were the same people that were sent out in John chapter 7 with the commission to arrest Jesus. And they came back empty-handed. These were the temple guards. These were Levites. Uh, a certain group of Levites were assigned to be temple police to keep order in the temple. And apparently they and Romans together came to pick up Jesus. Now why the Romans would be there is a curious thing. But apparently the Jews already had this thing all planned out. They intended to bring Jesus before Pilate the next morning. The Roman procurators typically would arise and try to start their business day at about sun up, around 6 o'clock. And they would try to be done with their business of the day by about 10 or 11. This is the normal Roman procedure of a government official. We find that the Jews actually did bring Jesus to Pilate around 6 in the morning. And they probably had to get their case on his calendar. And it was a bit of a rush job because it was Passover time and they wanted to get this all taken care of and, and cleaned up before Passover. So they had to get him into uh, Pilate's court on the particular day, first thing in the morning. And so in order to do that, they had to take Jesus and find occasions to condemn him among themselves so they could bring an accusation to Pilate the next morning. And therefore, they held all-night court sessions, which, by the way, was against their own rabbinic laws. To hold a court at night was against the rabbinic law for the simple reason that it seemed too suspicious. Why would you hold court at night uh, when people are sleeping? Why hold secret proceedings against somebody? It'd be harder for him to call witnesses in his defense and so forth in the middle of the night. And therefore the rabbis actually had a law that they could not hold court at night. But the Sanhedrin in this case was not interested in obeying their own laws, but only in getting the job done that they wanted done in a timely manner. But apparently, in order to get on Pilate's court calendar for the next morning, they had to uh, let Pilate know something about the case they were going to bring. And they apparently also at that time asked for a detachment of Roman soldiers to accompany them, suggesting that Jesus might have some disciples who might put up a fight. And that the Romans, in order to bring a prisoner to their own court, might uh, be on hand to help with the arrest. They were not mistaken. One of Jesus' disciples did put up a fight briefly, although Jesus made him stop, and it ended up being no, uh, no problem at all to the Romans or the Jews in the arrest, except that Jesus knocked them all over with a few words. But, uh, <laughs> and having a, no matter how many Romans they had with them, that wouldn't have helped them, uh, because uh, Jesus had apparently infinite power against any number of people that would come against him. But we see in verse 3 that the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with the lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Now, Jesus takes charge of the situation. He's the one they're coming to arrest. And he doesn't wait for them to speak. He sees them. He walks right up to them and says, Who are you looking for? And he just kind of initiates the situation. He takes charge. And we can see from what follows that he truly is in charge. He truly is in command of the situation, though he's greatly outnumbered by those who have come to arrest him. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Then when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. It is not known why they did this. Some may feel like they did this in mockery of him, but it seems hardly likely that the Roman soldiers would, would uh, you know, they're not, you know, Roman soldiers just want to have fun? I don't think so. I mean, they're not fun-loving guys. Uh, they are, they obviously are a no-nonsense, business-like uh, machine. And it seems that they fell over backward because they had no choice but to fall over backward. 
Now, Jesus said, I am he, in the Greek, that's ego a me, <clears throat> which can be translated I am he, or it can be translated I am. There is no he in it. Ego a me, it literally means I, I am. But it is also the normal way of saying it, I am he. So we need to be careful about assuming too much about it. Obviously, when Jesus said I am, we, in our minds, connect it with the divine name in the Old Testament, and probably rightly so. Back in John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am, or ego emi. And that may be how his words would be taken now. Of course, Jesus wasn't speaking Greek. He didn't say ego emi. He said whatever the Aramaic equivalent was, because that was the language he spoke. Nonetheless, John has rendered it with the words ego emi, and apparently means either I am he or simply I am. In any case, what he said was uh, powerful words, and so the, the people fell over backward to the ground. Then he asked them again, apparently after they recovered their feet, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave may have lost none. Now, the saying which he spoke is a reference to something he said in his prayer in, in chapter 17, verse 12. He had said, those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. And, and that's what is being quoted here in chapter 18, verse 9. Now, John is quoting it with sort of a double meaning. Obviously, John knew that when Jesus made that statement in John 17, 12, that it was talking about spiritual safety, that he had not lost any of them to the enemy. He was not talking about keeping them safe physically. In this case, though, John is apparently seeing Jesus keeping them safe from physical death as an analogy to him saving them from spiritual death also, because he is here talking about how Jesus delivered them from arrest and probable crucifixion that they would have suffered, but his stratagem was to get his arresters to verbally commit to who, whose name is on the warrant. Who are you coming to arrest? Well, the warrant says Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, well, that's me. That's not these people. Let them go then, right? You've just told me. I'm the one you want. I surrender. Let them go. And so in doing that, he prevented a wholesale arrest of rounding up of everybody. If he had allowed them to initiate things, they might just say, here, catch them all, take them all in. And instead, he, he started the conversation by making them commit to who it was they're coming to arrest. But first, he showed them that he was very much the master of the situation. Had he wished to, he could have knocked them down over and over again all night long. He said the same words both times, but without the same effect the second time. He wasn't interested in just keep knocking him down. He just wanted to show what he could do, I'm sure. He wanted to show that no one can take his life from him. He has the power to lay it down, and he has the power to take it up again, as he said in John chapter 10. No one was going to take his life. He was going to surrender it. Therefore, when this detachment of Roman and temple police came, he simply showed that he was not at their mercy. They were at his mercy. And when he said, I am, they fell over backward. When they got up, he decided... That's enough of that kind of demonstration. Now let's get back to business. Who are you here for? Me. I'm the one. Okay, then you've committed yourself. I'm the one. You've got the warrant to arrest. These men obviously are not on your warrant. They can go, right? And so he delivered his disciples from arrest on this occasion. And thus, in a secondary sense, fulfilled that statement he made, of those that you've given me, I have lost none. That is, none of them were arrested with him and none of them died with him on this occasion. Now, of course, the synoptic gospels include here something very significant, and John, interestingly, leaves it out. That is that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss at some point. All three synoptic gospels mention it and mention Jesus' response to him. He said something like, friend, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Um, but it's, it's not mentioned in John, so it's not clear whether that happened before the before Jesus had this exchange with the soldiers or after. In any case, Judas did have a role in identifying him here. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. 
The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Now, a couple things here. One is that the other synoptics also mention that Jesus cut off, I mean that Peter cut off this man's ear. Uh, Luke alone mentions that Jesus healed the ear. Now, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John all mention this cutting off of the ear. Only Luke mentions that Jesus touched the man's ear and healed it, put it back together again. Which must have been an amazing thing. Now, the, I mean, to the man himself. The man was there to arrest Jesus, and here Jesus is healing him, doing him a favor, and telling Peter to put away his sword. Now, John alone tells us that this man had a name, Malchus, which means that John knew this man by name. Did he know him at this point in time? Perhaps. Because the writer, as we shall see later, was acquainted with the high priest's family. And Malchus was a servant of the high priest, so maybe John, acquainted as he was with the high priest family, we'll talk about how that could possibly be the case when we get to a, a later verse. If he knew the family, he might well have known the, the servant's names. Depends on how well acquainted he was with the high priest family. Or an alternate view is that this man, Malchus, had subsequently become a believer. And that by the time John wrote this, the whole church knew the man's name. Because his testimony was well known among them. He had been among those that arrested Jesus and that Jesus had yet healed him. And uh, he may have been a well-known name among the disciples. Although the other synoptics don't mention his name. And that might argue more for the idea that John, the writer of this gospel, happened to know his name because of his acquaintance with the high priest family. Not important for us to solve that question, but it's an interesting one. Uh, and then Jesus rebuking Peter. In this case. Now, Peter no doubt was intending well, but his attempt to, Jesus, to rescue Jesus was obviously an amateurish attempt. Peter was a fisherman, not a fighter. And there were two swords among the disciples. The other disciple, whichever one it was, had another sword, must have been wise enough to keep it in his sheath. We know from Luke's gospel that there were two swords among them. Peter, unfortunately, had one of them. And uh, Peter drew his sword and uh, Maybe having just woken up from sleeping when he should have been staying awake, remember Jesus had told them, the other gospel tells them, Jesus had said, stay awake, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. Well, they, they didn't stay awake and pray, and therefore they did fall into temptation. And Jesus woke them as the arresting party was arriving. And Peter being perhaps groggy, and maybe having had maybe a little more wine at the Passover meal the night before than was advisable, and I don't, I don't mean to suggest that any of the disciples were luscious, but I mean there was no uh, stigma attached to drinking, you know, from four cups of wine at the dinner. Uh, maybe he was a little dizzy, who knows? He, he, the point is he hoped to do some kind of lethal harm to the attackers, and the best he could do was strike off a man's right ear, which was a very clumsy thing indeed, because Peter probably was right-handed, and if he he most naturally sliced the left ear of a man facing him. But maybe the man has back to him and, and he sliced his ear, or he was just so clumsy that he couldn't even hit a, a, a target at close range, and he sliced off the right ear specifically. It says it was the right ear. In any case, Peter's help was not going to be helpful once more, and uh, so Jesus tells him to put away his sword. In this case, John tells us that the reason he tells Peter to away his sword is because Jesus was now willing to drink the cup that the Father was giving him. He had prayed three times that that cup might be taken from him, uh, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. And lo and behold, it turned out it was not the will of God that he should be spared the cup. And so he recognized the sufferings he was about to face as the cup that his Father was handing him. And he was going to accept that. He's going to receive it, just like Job said, Shall we receive only the good things from the Lord and not the evil things also? To be resigned to God's will when you know it is God's will, when it's a situation out of your control, when it's something that God has determined by providence or by revelation to be what he wants you to go through, for you to resign yourself to and say, This is the cup my Father has given me, I'll drink it, is very much the attitude of both Job and Jesus and, frankly, every godly man we encounter in the, in the Bible. 
uh, the recognition that some sufferings cannot be avoided because they are the will of God. And Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, I think it's verse 19, he says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in doing well as unto a faithful creator. That is, if, you, if it's the will of God for you to suffer, that's what starts out. Those who suffer according to the will of God, what shall we do? Well, we shall commit ourselves to our faithful creator as we put our case in his hands instead of our own. How do, we, how do we commit our case into his hands? By continuing to do the same thing that's getting us in trouble. By continuing to do good. If you're suffering for doing good, Peter says, then continue to do good, and thus you put your case entirely in God's hands. You're not rescuing yourself for compromising, but you don't compromise, and you let the matter fall into the hands of God and let him decide what shall happen. Remember, David said, let me fall into the hands of God, not the hands of men, for his mercies are everlasting. And Jesus, of course, put himself in the hands of God. In fact, his dying words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Of course, that didn't save his life. And that's the important thing to note, that when you surrender yourself into the hands of God and resign yourself to his will, that doesn't mean, that, that's not a bargaining chip with God that, okay, now that you've done that, he's got to deliver you. No, when you surrender, that means you've got to be surrendered to whatever he decides, even if that's your death. But of course, because he died in the hand of God, he also was able to be risen in the hand of God. And that's, so he was vindicated after all. But he had to drink this cup that his father was giving him. In Matthew's version, it's interesting that the various ways in which Matthew tells us Jesus answered Peter on this occasion. In Matthew 26... 52, this is Jesus' answer to Peter in Matthew 26, 52. Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? And so... There's two different arguments given by Jesus to Peter why he should put away his sword in Matthew, and a third in John. In Matthew, the first one is, those who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now, frankly, this is not necessarily an absolutely true maxim. Many people have had lives of soldiery, have had lives of police work. Uh, many people have lived by their weapons and by their fighting and uh, warfare and have not died in war. They've, uh, you know, retired and, and survived and died peaceably in their beds. It's not, uh, it's not a proverb or a maxim or a, a, a truism that those who use the sword will necessarily perish by the sword, although it is, of course, the case that when one is depending on his sword for his security, he has nothing better than that to depend upon. And he may find himself outgunned by his opponent and is certainly at risk of perishing by the same means by which he seeks to live. But I think in this case, Jesus' words must mean something like this to Peter. We are outnumbered here. Any of you who seek to save his life by using the sword will die that way. It certainly would be the case. If the disciples would pull their swords out and start fighting these Romans, every one of the disciples would lie dead by the end of that skirmish. And that any of us in this situation who seek to survive by using our swords will find that we will die by using our swords. It's similar to what Jesus said about whosoever seeks to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Uh, he's essentially saying... We don't need swords to protect us here because he says, if I wished I could call for 12 legions of angels, that'd be more than enough to get us out of this situation. But then how would the scripture be fulfilled that says this must happen? So there's three ways Jesus speaks to Peter as an argument to put away his sword. One is that he's inviting his own death. That is, Peter is inviting his own death if he seeks to you know, survive by the use of his sword. So put it away. Uh, secondly, we don't need swords. We have the angels. If God, if we wished we could call on the angels and, and God would send them and we'd be well protected. He has given his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways and in their hands they will keep 
bear the up less thou dash thy foot against the stone. So we don't need to worry about uh, human attackers when God's angels are available to protect us in the will of God. But the third thing he said is apparently what John records. And he says, shouldn't I be resigned to this? This is the cup my father has given me. It must be the cup he intends me to drink. My father is the one I'm here to please, not myself. And if it pleases him to bruise me, and that's what it says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that is Jesus. Well, then that's the cup my father wants me to have. If it pleases him, it pleases me, I will drink the cup that he gives me. That is the attitude of Jesus and the attitude of every godly person in a similar situation. In verse 12, then, <clears throat> says, Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, this interview before Annas is entirely omitted by the Synoptic Gospels. If you read the Synoptics, they only focus on Jesus being taken before the Sanhedrin, which was superintended by Caiaphas. And uh, John acknowledges that this happened too, but John indicates that before he was taken before the Sanhedrin, before he was taken to Caiaphas, he was taken first to Annas, the high priest. Now, Annas was the older high priest. According to Luke 3, 2, when Luke is giving us the political lineup of how things stood in Jerusalem and, and Judea and, and, and uh, Galilee in the time when John the Baptist began preaching, he mentions Annas and Caiaphas being high priests. That is, there were two high priests. Now, the law of Moses only allowed for one high priest, but in the days of the Maccabeans, after the Maccabean Revolt, or even before that, in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes and the Syrian domination, the high priesthood was greatly compromised by basically being given to the highest bidder. The Syrian overlord, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, sold the high priesthood to the Jew that would give him the most money. And there were many intrigues and many high priests uh, were assassinated by rivals and so forth. And, uh, it, it, was a lot of, it was really messed up. The hereditary priesthood of Aaron was greatly compromised in the two centuries before the time of Christ. And I'm not sure exactly what hereditary basis Annas had to be in high priest, but he was the more popular high priest among the Jews. And he had been the high priest from 6 AD to 15 AD. In other words, from the time Jesus was about 10 years old until he was about 19. And Annas had been removed. He had been appointed, first of all, by Quirinius, the governor of Syria, in 6 AD. And then, in the year 15, he had been removed by Valerius Gratus, who was the prefect of Judea at the time, an office that Pilate later held. Now, three years later, in 18 AD, Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, was appointed by the same... Uh, Valerius Gratus, and he held that office for 18 years, which is the longest any high priest in the first century held office. And he remained high priest after Valerius Gratus left that position to Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate, for whatever reason, left Caiaphas in position, probably because he was less popular and less powerful among the Jews than Annas was, and less of a competitor for their loyalties. Caiaphas, uh, was son-in-law to Annas. Annas had five of his own sons succeed him as priest, and one son-in-law, and one grandson, too. So Annas's family really controlled the priesthood for some time. But although Annas had been deposed by the Romans, many of the Jews respected him more than they respected Caiaphas. He was the high priest emeritus, retired, sort of like we talk about retired presidents as still president. And so also, uh, the, Jesus was a notable prisoner. Annas had an interest in it. In honor of the older man, they took Jesus before Annas first to get his licks in, and then they would take him before the court formally, which was going to be superintended by Caiaphas. Okay, so he went before Annas, 
And before we read what happened there, we have interjected this little uh, story about Peter's first of three denials. John, unlike the other Gospels, divides up the denials of Jesus into different parts of the story, interweaving it. It says in verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door, and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. And the servants of the officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now this was, of course, the first time that Peter denied Christ. There would be three. And in Mark's Gospel, in Mark uh, 1468, it says, as soon as Peter denied him this first time, the cock crowed. Now you might say, well, isn't that a bit early? I thought the cock was supposed to crow after Jesus denied him three times. Well, in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus makes the prediction, it's Mark chapter 14, verse 30, he says to Peter, before the cock crows twice, you will have denied me three times. So as Mark tells the story, the first time Peter denied the Lord, he heard the cock crow the first time, which should have been the warning to him. Hup. You know, that sounds like the beginnings of a fulfillment of this prediction. I've got to guard myself not to do that anymore. But instead, he denied Jesus two more times, and then the cock crew the second time. And that's when Peter, you know, recognized that, the, that he had been, uh, he had fulfilled the predictions of Jesus about this. 